or evening. It really depends on when you're watching this. But anyway, I hope you had a good week. The news about Haiti Christian Development was kind of exciting. When they had the 42 ministers in for a time to do the future planning. The elders in Polto have done an excellent job in promoting and evangelizing the mountainous area of Haiti. That's good. The, uh, just think, only five days till Christmas and 11 days till the end of the year. I don't know about you, but uh, I'm ready to start a new year. This 2020 has been something kind of special in a lot of ways. We've had COVID. We've had record number of hurricanes, fires, ice storms. Just a lot of things have happened during this year. You know, God tests us in many ways. And what's the purpose of a test? The purpose of a test is to see where we are and what kind of progress we're making. So when God gives us tests, like he did Abraham, it says in Genesis, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to Abraham, here I am, he replied. And then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrificing there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Well, can you imagine what Sarah thought when Abraham slipped Isaac out in the middle of the night to take him on that? It was a test. God was testing Abraham. It was an emotional test, a psychological test. But God tests us in many ways. Sometimes he lets other people test us. Look at what happened to Job. God told Satan, he says, you can test him, but you cannot kill him. And Satan did test Job. But Job stayed true to his beliefs all the way through. And he had many, many blessings after that. Think about Joseph. Whenever they said, they were going to put him in the well and they were going to kill him. And Reuben said, when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him to this cistern here on the desert. But don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and to take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of the robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing. And they took him and threw him into a cistern. Now the cistern was empty and there was no water. Test can be physical, as this one was. He's put in there, no water, and you know it had to hurt him to be in there like that. It was a physical test. And then Joseph passed that test, and he moves on up. It's God's way of showing people that if they're faithful to God, good things happen. But then he goes down, and Potter wife accuses him falsely. And once again, he's put in prison. He was put in prison because of he was falsely accused. But once again, God stood with him. And Joseph did many good things. And many things was accomplished. Remember, a test is to show where you've been and where you're going and where you stand right now. So let me tell you something. We've gone through 2020 with all these tests. Some have been very severe. Some of us lost loved ones. But if you've gone through this year and still believe in God, still want to be one of his children, guess what? You made an A on that test. You passed it. And so the next year is going to be much, much better. Paul asked them, he says, has God rejected his people? By no means. I'm an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And he gives four different types of evidence of this. 
First is personal. Paul was one of the chief persecutors and people against God initially. But yet, he now has become an avid follower of Christ. And he knows that God loves him. Secondly, Israel, the Jews, were a chosen people. People of the covenant. And that's uh, important. We need to always remember. Whom he foreknew. And that for, to foreknow somebody or means that you love them. You're concerned about them. You're interested in them. And third, he gives biblical, biblical evidence. He talks about Elijah. And he talks about how Elijah says, <clears throat> Do you not know what the scriptures say of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed thy prophets. They have demolished thy altars. And I am alone left, and they seek my life. But what was God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed kneel to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it's by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Grace and works are not compatible. They do not work. And love and rejection are mutually incompatible. And then, He goes on to talk about how he hardened, has hardened these people's hearts. He's hardened their hearts. And he says, What then? Israel f failed to obtain what it sought. The elect obtained it. The elect. Those who believe in Christ. They're the ones who have obtained it. But the rest was hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit, a stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear down to this very day. This idea of hardening of the heart is something that each of us have to resist every day. We want our hearts to be tender and receptive to God's word, not to the fact that we are hardening our hearts against God's word. And people whose hearts are hardened are very, very difficult to teach them the word of Christ and have them come to become one of his children. It's a bad situation to be in. Part of my prayers on most nights is, God, please keep my heart tender and receptive to the Holy Spirit's actions so that I can do what you want me to do and become more Christ-like. If your heart is hardened, you can't do those things. It's impossible. And he says that, David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a pitfall and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. He's saying, these people will not be able to see God, will not be able to see Christ. And they will have to work very hard. Their backs will be bent because of this burden of being against God that they carry. And then he goes on to say, So I, I ask, have they stumbled so as to fall? By no means. But through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. We're really going to talk about three or four different periods of time here. The first period is when the Jews have rejected Christ. That period has happened. That period has happened. Now we're in the second period where Paul has been sent to the Gentiles, Gentiles, Gentiles. So each of us has every opportunity to become a Christian. And he says, this was done in order to make them jealous 
I remember when I was dating Beverly, <clears throat> I had to work one night. I come up to a ball game, and lo and behold, there she's sitting with another guy. His name was Jack Webb. I remember it to this day. This is 63 years ago. And it hurt my feelings, but it made me very jealous. I did something very stupid. I went up to Beverly. I said, I need to talk to you. So she came down. We talked. I said, you know, it's time for you to make a decision. She made the right decision. She chose me. But being jealous is something that makes you or spurns you to action and you do things. And what they're trying to do here, God's trying to do by making the Jews jealous, is he wants them to come back to him. He wants them to become children of his. And he's using this technique, a proven technique, to work. And we're in that period of time right now. We're reaching out to the Gentiles. It appears to me that the Gentiles, to a large degree, are let their hearts being hardened as to God's word too. It's sad. It's really a sad situation. But he says, now if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failures mean riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Inclusion means, he says that once, and I do not know when this happened, there will be another period of time when Israel comes back to God. I don't know how long it will be. It may be a year, maybe a million years, a thousand years, who knows? But it's in God's time frame. And it says these Jews are going to come back and they're going to accept Christ as a Savior. And then the riches will be wonderful. It says, I magnify my energy in order to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. Don't forget, this letter is being written to the Christians in Rome, and some of them are Jewish Christians. So it's being written to them at this time. And he says, for if their rejection means a reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? He's talking about everlasting life. If they will accept Christ, they'll have everlasting life. When you and I accept Christ, we have everlasting life. Death no longer can be held over our heads. Spiritual life will continue forever and ever. Throughout eternity. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a very difficult time visualizing eternity, which means forever and ever. Just like I have a difficult time believing or realizing, visualizing that there has always been a God. Infinity, no starting place. It was always here. For my feeble mind, those are two things that are extremely difficult for me to comprehend. But he says... If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Once these people start accepting Christ, the dough, the lump, will be able to expand. And that's what God wants. He wants all of the people who have accepted him as their Savior the elect, to be with him forever and ever. And that's what the Jews are fighting against. This is a plan that he has for them. This is a plan that he has for the Jews that they will come back, that the Gentiles will become Christians and they will go forward and continue throughout the world and eventually the Jews will come into the fold too. You know, when I talk about the entire world, when we were talking earlier about the hardships that face the world, the hardships are not just face the United States. The hardships of COVID-19 and other things that's happened this year have faced the entire world. And God wants the entire world to come to him, to be with him forever and ever. And I hope that's what all of us want. 
Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for the book of Romans. We thank you for your plans from the beginning to the end. And we thank you for the intermediate plans that are, we're, that are in force right now. Help us listen to those plans. Help us to accept those plans. And help us to do what's right in thy world. Help us be drawn closer to you. This is our prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.